So you mentioned The Plague by Camus. There's a lot of different ways to read that book, but one of them, especially given how it was written, is that the plague symbolizes uh, Nazi Germany and uh, the Hitler regime. What do you learn about human nature from a figure like Adolf Hitler, that he's able to uh, captivate the minds of millions, rise to power, and take on, pull in the whole world into a global war? I was born nine years after the end of World War II. And I grew up in a generation that was, fig, you know, with my parents who were fixated on that, um, on, you know, what happened. And my father, you know, at that time, the, you know, the kind of the, the resolution in the minds of most Americans, and I think people around the world, is that there was, there had been something wrong with the German people that, you know, the Germans had been particularly susceptible to this kind of uh, demagoguery and to following a powerful leader and um, and to industrializing cruelty and and and, uh, and murder. And my father always differed with that. My father said, this is not a German problem. This can happen to all of us. We're all just inches away from barbarity. And the thing that keeps us safe in this country are the institutions of our democracy, our constitution. It's not our nature. You know, our nature has to uh, has to be restrained, and it and that comes through self restraint. But it also, you know, the beauty of our country is that we develop, we devise these institutions that are designed to allow us to flourish, uh, but at the same time, uh, not to give give us enough freedom to flourish, but also create enough order to keep us from collapsing into barbarity. So, um, you know, one of the other things that my father talked about from when I was little, you know, he would ask us this question, if you, if you were the family and Anne Frank came to your door and asked you to hide her, would you be one of the people who hit her at risk your own life? Or would you be one of the people who turned her in? And of course, we would all say, well, of course, we would hide Anne Frank and take the risk. Um, but, you know, that's been something, uh, kind of a lesson, a challenge that has been, uh, that has always been near the forefront of my mind, that if a totalitarian system ever occurs in the United States, which my father thought was quite possible, he, he was conscious about how fragile democracy actually is, um, that would I be one of the ones who would resist the totalitarianism, or would I be one of the people who, who went along with it? Would I be one of the people who was at the train station in, you know, Krakow, or, uh, or, um, or you know, even Berlin, and saw people being shipped off to camps and just put my head down and pretend I didn't see it because talking about it would be uh, destructive to my career and maybe my freedom and even my life. Um, so, you know, that has been a challenge that my father gave to me and all of my brothers and sisters. And it's something that uh, I've never forgotten. A lot of us would like to believe we would uh, resist in that situation, but the reality is most of us wouldn't. And that's a good thing to think about that uh, human nature is such that we're selfish, even when there's an atrocity going on all around us. And we also, you know, we have the capacity to deceive ourselves. And all of us tend to kind of judge ourselves by our intentions and our actions. What have you learned about life from your father, Robert F. Kennedy? First of all, I'll say this about my uncle, because, you know, I, I'm going to apply that question to my uncle and my father. My uncle was asked when he first met Jackie Bouvier, who later became Jackie Kennedy. She was a reporter for a newspaper, and she was doing, she she had a kind of column where she'd do these, these kind of um, uh, pithy interviews uh, with, with both famous people and kind of man in the street interviews. And she was interviewing him, and she asked him, um, 
what he, she thought what he believed his best quality was, his, his strongest virtue, and she thought that he would say courage because he had been a war hero. He had, he was the only uh, president who, and this is when he was senator, by the way, uh, who received the Purple Heart. And, you know, he had a, a very kind of famous story of, of him as a hero in World War II. And then he had come home and he had written a book on, on moral courage among American politicians and won the Pulitzer Prize. That book profiles in courage, and, uh, which was a series of incidents where um, American political leaders made decisions to uh, to embrace principle, even though their careers were at stake, and in most cases were destroyed by their choice. So she thought he was going to say courage, but he didn't. He said curiosity, and um, I think you know, looking back at his life, that the best that that it was true, and that was the quality that allowed him to put himself in the shoes of his adversaries. And he always said that if you, if the only way that we're going to have peace is if we're able to put ourselves in the shoes of our adversaries, understand their behavior and their contact, that context. And that's why he was able to, um, you know, during the, uh, he was able to resist the intelligence apparatus and the military during the Bay of Pigs, when they said, you've got to send in the Essex, the aircraft carrier. And he said, no, even though he'd only been in month, two months in office, he was able to stand up to them because of because he was able to put himself in the shoes of both Castro and Khrushchev and understand there's got to be another solution to this. And then during the Cuban Missile Crisis, he was able to until when the, the, the narrative was, okay, Khrushchev acted in a way, as an aggressor, to put missiles in our hemisphere. How dare he do that? And Jack and my father were able to say, well, wait a minute, he's doing that because we put missiles in Turkey and Italy that were right on, you know, the Turkish ones right on the Russian border. And they then made a secret deal with Dobrynin, with Ambassador Dobrynin and, you know, with Khrushchev, um, to uh, to remove the missiles in in Turkey if he moved the Jupiter missiles from to Turkey if if uh, uh, so long as Khrushchev removed them from from Cuba every there were thirteen men on the executive on the end what they call the Ancon committee which was the group of people who were deciding you know what the action was what what they were going to do to end the Cuban Missile Crisis and virtually I, and of those men 11 of them wanted to invade and wanted to bomb and invade and it was Jack and then uh, later on my my father and and Bob McNamara who were the only people who were with him but because he was able to see the world from Khrushchev's point of view. He believed that there was another solution. And then he also had the moral courage. So um, my father, you know, to get back to your question, famously said that moral courage is the most important quality and it's more, it's more rare than courage on the football field or courage in battle than physical courage. It's much more difficult to come by, but it's the most important quality in a human being. And you think that kind of empathy that you referred to, that requires moral courage? It certainly requires moral courage to to act on it. Hmm. You know, and particularly, you know, in, you know, any time that a nation is at war, there's kind of a momentum or an inertia that says, okay, let's not look at this from the other person's point of view. And um, that's the time we really need to do that. Well, if we can apply that style of empathy, style of curiosity to the current war in Ukraine, what is your understanding of why Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022? Vladimir Putin could have avoided the war in the Ukraine. His invasion was illegal, it was unnecessary, and it was brutal. Um, but I think it's important for us to move beyond these kind of comic book depictions of a uh, you know of this insane uh, uh, avaricious Russian leader who wants to 
you know, restore the, the Soviet empire. And that that's why, and it was, and it made an unfoked, unprovoked um, invasion of the Ukraine. He was provoked and we were provoking him and we were provoking him for, for since 1997. And it's not just me that's saying that. I mean, when, when, and that, and before right before Putin ever came in, we were provoking Russia, the Russians in this way unnecessarily. And to go back that time in 1992, when the Russians moved out of when the Soviet Union was collapsing, the Russians moved out of East Germany, and they did that, which was a huge concession to them. They had 400,000 troops in East Germany at that time, and they were facing NATO troops on the other side of the wall. So Gorbachev made this huge concession where he said to George Bush, I'm going to move all of our troops out, and you can then reunify Germany under NATO, which was a hostile army to the to the Soviet. It was created to you know uh, uh, with hostile intent toward the Soviet Union. And he said, "You can take Germany, but I want your promise that you will not move NATO to the east." And James Baker, who was his Secretary of State, famously said, "I will not move NATO. We will not move NATO one inch to the east." So then, uh, five years later, in 1997, Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was kind of the father of the neocons, who was a Democrat at that time, served in the in the uh, Carter administration. He said he published a paper, a blueprint for moving NATO right up to the Russian border, a thousand miles to the east, and and taking over 14 nations. And at that time, George Kennan, who was the kind of the deity of American dip, diplomats, he was probably arguably the, arguably the most important diplomat in American history. He was the architect of the con containment policy during World War II. And he said, this is insane and it's unnecessary. And if you do this, it's going to provoke the Soviet, uh, I mean, the Russians to a violent response. And we should be making friends with the Russians. They lost the Cold War. We should be treating them the way that we treated the, our adversaries after World War II, like with a Marshall Plan to try to help them incorporate into Europe and to be part of the, the brotherhood of, you know, of man and of Western nations. We shouldn't continue to be treating them as an enemy and particularly surrounding them at their borders. William Perry, who was then the Secretary of, of uh, Defense under Bill Clinton, threatened to resign. He was so upset by this plan to move NATO to the east. And William Burns, who was then the U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union, who is now at this moment the head of the CIA, said at that time the same thing. If you do this, it is going to provoke the Russians toward a military response. And the, the, we, we, we moved it. We moved all around Russia. We moved to 14 nations, 1,000 miles to the east. And we put Aegis missile systems in two nations in Romania and Poland. So we did what, you know, what the Russians had done to us in 1962 that had provoked, would have provoked an invasion of Cuba. We put those missile systems back there, and then we walk away unilaterally, walk away from the two um, nuclear missile treaties, the intermediate nuclear missile treaties that we had with the Soviet Union, with Russia, and we neither of us would put um, those missile systems on the borders. We walk away from that, and we put Aegis missile systems, which are nuclear capable. They can carry the Tomahawk missiles, which have nuclear warheads. So the last. Uh, country that they didn't take was the Ukraine. And the Russians said, and, and in fact, Bill Perry said this, or, or William Burns said it, so now the head of the CIA, it is a red line. If we go into, if we bring NATO into Ukraine, that is a red line for the Russians. They cannot live with it. They cannot live with it. Russia has been invaded three times through the Ukraine. The last time it was invaded, we killed, or the Germans killed one out of every seven Russians. They destroyed my uncle. Described what happened to Russia um, in his famous American University speech in in, uh, in 1963, 60 years ago this month, or he or last month, 60 years ago in June, June 10th, 1963. He told that speech was telling American people, "Put yourself in the shoes of the Russians. We need to do that if we're gonna if we're gonna make peace." And he said, all of us have been taught 
you know, that we won the war, but we didn't win the war. The Russians, if anybody won the war against Hitler, it was the Russians. Their country was destroyed. They, they, all of their cities, and he said, imagine if all of the cities from the East Coast of Chicago were reduced to rubble and all of the fields burned, all of the forests burned. That's what happened to Russia. That's what they gave so that we could get rid of Adolf Hitler. And he had them put themselves in their position. And, you know, today there's none of that happening. We have refused repeatedly to uh, to talk to the Russians. We've broken up. There's two treaties, the Minsk agreements, which the Russians were willing to sign. And they said, we will stay. out. The Russians didn't want the Ukraine. They showed that when, they, when the Donbass region voted 90 to 10 to leave and go to Russia, Putin said no. We want Ukraine to stay intact, but we want you to sign a Minsk Accords to, to you know, they the Russians were were very worried because of the U.S. involvement in the coup in Ukraine in 2014, and then the oppression and the and the you know and the killing of 14,000 ethnic Russians and Russia has a nat the same re, the same way that if Mexico put Aegis missile systems from China or Russia on our border and then killed 14,000 uh, expats American, we would go in there. Oh, he does have a, a national security interest in the Ukraine. He has an interest in protecting the Russian-speaking people of the Ukraine, the ethnic Russians, and the Minsk Accords did that. It, it left Ukraine as part of Russia. It left them as a semi-autonomous region that could and, uh, continue to use their own language, which was essentially banned by the coup by the government we put in in 2014. Um, and uh, and we wouldn't we we sabotaged that agreement. And and in, we now know in April of 2022, Zelensky and uh, Putin had inked a deal already to another peace agreement. And that the United States sent Boris Johnson, the neocons in the White House sent Boris Johnson over to the Ukraine to sabotage that agreement. So what do I think? I think this is a proxy war. I think this is a, you know, this is a war that the neocons in the White House wanted. They've said for two decades they wanted this war. And that they wanted to use Ukraine as a pawn in a proxy war between uh, United States and Russia, the same as we used Afghanistan. And they, in fact, they say it, this is the model. Let's use the Afghanistan model. That was said again and again. And to, to, to get the Russians to overextend their troops and then fight them using local uh, fighters and U.S. weapons. And when President Biden was asked, why are we in the Ukraine? He was honest. He says to depose Vladimir Putin, regime change for Vladimir Putin. And when his defense secretary, Lloyd Austin, in April 2022, was asked, you know, why are we there? He said to degrade the Russians' capacity to fight anywhere, to exhaust the Russian army and degrade its capacity to fight elsewhere in the world. That's not a humanitarian mission. That's not what we were told. We were we were told this was an unprovoked invasion. Uh, but and that we're there to bring a humanitarian relief to the Ukrainians. But that is the opposite. That is a war of attrition that is designed to chew up, to turn this little nation into an abattoir of death for the flower of Ukrainian youth in order to advance a geopolitical ambition of certain people within the White House. And, I, you know, I think that's wrong. We should be talking to the Russians the way that, you know, Nixon talked to Brezhnev, the way that Bush talked to Gorbachev, the way that my uncle talked to Khrushchev, we need to be talking with the Russians. We should and 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 negotiating, and we need to be looking about how do we end this and preserve peace in Europe. Would you, as president, sit down and have a conversation with Vladimir Putin and Vladimir Zelensky separately and together to Absolutely. negotiate peace? Absolutely. What about Vladimir Putin? He's been in power since two thousand. Uh, so as the old adage goes, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Uh, do you think he has been corrupted by being in power for so long? If you think of the man, if you look at his mind. Listen, I don't know exactly. Um, I can't say because I just, I don't know enough about him or about, you know, I my the evidence that I've seen 
is that he is homicidal. He kills his enemies or poisons them. And, you know, the reaction I've seen to that, to his, those accusations from him have, have not been to deny that, but to kind of laugh it off. Well, I think he's a dangerous man and that, of course, you know, um, there's probably corruption in his regime. Uh, but having said that, it's not our business to change the Russian government. And anybody who thinks it's a good idea to do regime change in Russia, which has more nuclear weapons than we do, um, is, I think, irresponsible. And, you know, Vladimir Putin himself has said, you know, we will not live in a world without Russia. And it was clear when he said that, that he was talking about himself. And, uh, and he has his hand on a button that could bring, you know, Armageddon to the entire planet. So why are we messing with this? It's not our job to change that regime. And and we should be making friends with the Russians. We shouldn't be treating them as an enemy. Now we've pushed them into the camp with China. That's not a good thing for our country. And by the way, you know what we're doing now does not appear to be weakening Putin at all. Putin now, you know, if you believe the the polls that are coming out of Russia, they show him. You know, the most recent polls that I've seen. Um, show him with an 89% popularity that people in Russia support the war in Ukraine and that uh, and they support him as an individual. So, um, and I understand there's problems with polling and, you know, you don't know what to believe, but, but the polls consistently show that. And, um, and I, you know, it's not America's business to be the policeman of the world and to be changing regimes in the world. That's illegal. We're not, we shouldn't be breaking international laws. You know, we should actually uh, be looking for ways to improve relationships with Russia, not to, you know, not to destroy Russia, not to destroy, not, and not to choose its leadership for them. That's up to the Russian people, not us. So... Step one is to sit down and empathize with the leaders of both nations to understand their history, their concerns, their hopes, just ha to open the door for conversation so they're not back to the corner. Yeah, and I think the U.S. can play a really important role, and a U.S. president can play a really important role by reassuring the Russians that we're not going to consider them an enemy anymore, that we want to be friends. And it doesn't mean that you have to let down your guard completely the way that you do it, which was the way President Kennedy did it, is you do it one step at a time. You take baby steps. We do a unilateral move to reduce our, you know, our, the, our hostility and aggression and see if the Russians reciprocate. And, um, and that's the way that we should be doing it. And, you know, we should be easing our way into a positive relationship with Russia. We have a lot in common with Russia, and we should be friends with Russia and with the Russian people. And, you know, apparently there's been 350,000 Ukrainians who have died at least in this war. And uh, and there's probably been uh, 60 or 80,000 Russians, and that should not give us any joy. It should not give us any, you know, I saw... Lindsey Graham on TV saying, you know, anything we can, something to the extent that anything we can do to kill Russians is a good use of our money, that it is not. You know, those are, those are somebody's children. They're, you know, we should have compassion for them. Um, this war is an unnecessary war. We should settle it through negotiation, through diplomacy, through statecraft, and not through weapons. Do you think this war can come to an end purely through military operations? No, I mean, I don't think there's any way in the world that the Ukrainians can beat the Russians. I don't think there's any appetite in Europe. I think Europe is now, you know, uh, in having severe problems in Germany, Italy, France. You're seeing these riots. There's internal problems in those countries. There is no appetite in um, in uh in Europe for sending men to die in Ukraine. And the Ukrainians do not have anybody left. The Ukrainians are using press gangs to, uh, to you know, to fill the ranks of their armies. Men, military age men, 
are trying as hard as they can to get out of the Ukraine right now to avoid going to the front. The front, you know, the Russians apparently have been killing Ukrainians at a seven to one ratio. My son fought over there and he told me it's, you know, artillery. He had, um, he had firefights with the Russians mainly at night, but he said most of the battles were artillery wars during the day. And they, the Russians now out, uh, outgun the NATO forces 10 to 1 in artillery. Oh, they're killing um, at a horrendous rate. Now, you know, my interpretation of what's happened so far is that the Putin actually went in early on with a small force because he expected to meet somebody on the other end of a negotiating table that once he went in. And uh, and that when that didn't happen, they did not have a large enough force to be able to mount an offensive. And so they've been building up that force up till now, and they now have that force. And even against this small original force, the Ukrainians have been uh, helpless. All of their offenses have died. They've now killed, you know, the head of the Ukrainian um, special forces, which was the probably, arguably, by many accounts, the best uh, elite military unit in all of Europe. The the com commandant, the commander of of the uh, that special forces group, had gave a, a speech about. Uh, four months ago, saying that 86% of his men are dead or wounded and will cannot return to the front. He cannot rebuild that force. Um, the uh, And, you know, the, the, the troops that are now headed, uh, that are now filling the gaps of all those 350,000 men who have been lost are, uh, are scantily trained and they're arriving green at the front. Many of them do not want to be there. Many of them are giving up and going over the Russian side. We've seen this again and again and again, including platoon-sized groups that are defecting to the Russians. And um, I don't think it's possible to win. And anybody, <laughs> you know, I, I saw, I, I, of course, I've studied World War II history exhaustively, but I saw a, um, there's a new, I think it's a Netflix series of documentaries that I highly recommend to people. They're, it's, they're colorized versions of the black and white mm -hmm. um, films from the battles of World War II, but it's all the battles of World War II. So I watched Stalingrad the other night, and uh, you know the, the willingness of the Russians to, um, to fight on against any kind of odds and to sac make huge sacrifices of Russians, the Russians themselves, who are making the sacrifice with their lives, the willingness of them to do that for their motherland is almost inexhaustible. It is incomprehensible to think that the uh, that Ukraine can can beat Russia in a war. It would be like Mexico beating the United States. It, it's just it's impossible to think that it can happen. And you know, Russia has has deployed a tiny, tiny fraction of its military so far. And, uh, you know, now it has China with its mass production capacity supporting its war effort. It's just, it's a, it's a hopeless situation and we've been lied to. You know, we're the, the press in our country and our government are just, are just, you know, promoting this lie that the, the Ukrainians are about to win and that everything's going great and that, Putin's on the run, and there's all this wishful thinking because of the the Wagner group, you know, the uh, the Prigozhin. Prigozhin and the Wagner group, that this was an internal coup and it showed dissent and weakness of Putin, and none of that is true. That was a that that insurgency, which wasn't even an insurgency. He only got four thousand of his of his men to follow him out of twenty thousand. And they were quickly stopped, and nobody in the Russian military, the oligarchy, the political system, nobody supported it, you know. And but we're being told, oh yeah, it's the beginning of the end for Putin. He's weakened, he's wounded, he's on his way out, and all of these things are just lies that we are being fed. So and, to push back on a small aspect of this that you kind of implied, so I've traveled to Ukraine, and one thing that I should say, similar to the Battle of Stalingrad, it is just not, is not only the Russians that fight to the end. I think Ukrainians are very yeah. willing to fight to the end. And the morale there is quite high. I've talked to nobody 
this was a year ago in August with her son, everybody was proud to fight and die for their country. And there's some aspect where this war unified the people to get, gave them a reason and an understanding that this is what it means to be Ukrainian and I will fight to the death to yeah, defend this land. I, you know, I would agree with that. And I, I should have said that myself at the beginning. But, you know, that's one of the reason my son went over there to fight because the, you know, he was inspired by the valor of the Ukrainian people and the, you know, this extraordinary willingness of them. And I think Putin thought it would be much easier to sweep into Ukraine. And he found, you know, a stone wall of, of Ukrainians, whether ready to put their their lives and their bodies on the line. But that to me makes the, the whole episode even more tragic is that, you know, um, I don't believe, I, I, you know, I, I think that the U.S. role in this um, has been, uh, has, you know, that there, there, were, there were many opportunities to settle this war, and the Ukrainians wanted to settle it. Vladimir Zelensky, when he ran in 2019, here's a guy who's a, a comedian. He's, a, he's an actor. Um, he had no political experience, and yet he won this election with 70% of the vote. Why? He won on a peace platform. Anyone promising to sign the Minsk Accords, and yet something happened when he got in there that made him suddenly pivot. And you know, I think it's a good guess what happened. I think he was, you know, he came under threat by ultra natural nationalists within his own administration, uh, and the insistence of neocons like Victoria Nuland in the White House that you know we, we don't want peace with Putin; we want a war. Do you worry about a nuclear war? Yeah, I worry about it. It's uh, it seems like a silly question, but it's not. It's a serious question. Well, the reason it's not, uh, you know, the reason it it uh, might it's not is just because uh, people seem to be in this kind of dream state about that it'll never happen, and yet you know we're um, it, it can happen very easily, and it can happen at any time. And, you know, if we push the Russians too far, you know, I I don't doubt that Putin, if he felt like his regime was in, you know, or his nation was in danger, that the United States was going to be able to place, you know, a, a quizzling on, you know, in into the Kremlin, um, that he would use nuclear, you know, torpedoes. Um and uh, you know these uh, these strategic weapons that they have, and that could be the once you do that, you, nobody controls the trajectory. By the way, 